Yes. Hello, everybody. I am going to set my stopwatch for 40 minutes instead of 50 minutes. So we are a go at 40 minutes. Um, my name is Kathy Edwards. I am the director of the New England Foundation for the Arts, which is headquartered in Boston, works in New England, around the country, and internationally. Thank you, Simon, for the invitation to join you here today. Thank you for all of you. It's been an incredibly inspiring day and so fantastic to hear from some of the current ArtsLink fellows as well. Um, I'll be candid. I accepted this invitation in part because early in my career, I had some amazingly deeply influential opportunities as a result of ArtsLink. And that was the opportunity to host three different ArtsLink fellows. Uh, when I was at Dance Theater Workshop, I learned so much from those individuals. And I think I also learned, honestly, how to be a host and in an international context, truly, of reciprocity. Um, so I owe a lot to the program, and it's a way to pay it forward just a tiny bit. I'm excited to moderate a discussion of four brilliant women. Um, their bios are in your program, but super briefly, I'm going to give you like one sentence on each of them. Um, and I'm going out, well, no, I'm going to go in order of where they're sitting. We have Zeva Rahman, a senior program officer for the Building Bridges program of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, who also has a storied career as a producer of complex arts initiatives and projects, both in the US and internationally. Next to Zeba, Michelle Coffey. Michelle is the director of the Lambent Foundation and an experienced philanthropist who has focused on a number of arenas, including health and justice and human rights, as well as arts and culture. Next to Michelle is Rashida Bumbre, who's a senior program manager of the Arts Exchange, the Open Society Foundation's Global Arts for Social Justice Initiative. I am a dance lover first and foremost, so I'm also going to share that she's an accomplished choreographer as well as curator. And um, next to Rashida, Barbara Lanciers, who might need no introduction here, the director of the Trust for Mutual Understanding, a longtime supporter of international exchange related to the arts and to the environment, and a theater artist in her own right. Um, we're here today to share with you our experience working as funders with an international commitment. What are the principles of our work? Why do we engage actively with international work? Uh, Zeba said to me last week when we were on a planning phone call, the why of this work is clear. It's the how of this work that keeps us up at night, which I... I think is really true, and we certainly just heard a really beautiful statement from Simone Bro about the why of international exchange. Um, from my own perspective at NIFA, we invest in international collaboration and understanding because it is so closely connected to, it is the same as our belief in equity and access to culture for all people. And it is really at the heart of our core values that artists and cultural production are essential to a thriving and open society. We also invest as art in artists and cultural workers as leaders. And like all humans, they benefit from the learning new perspective and relationships they develop when they engage in global conversations. And as others have said so eloquently today, artists are leaders who contribute uniquely to building cultural citizenship, sharing and exchanging stories, building participation and inclusion, uh, connecting us to being more human and more innovative. At NIFA this year, we've just supported five months of international US residencies for artistic ensembles from Ukraine and Egypt under the auspices of the Center Stage program. I'm so glad Nina showed a few photographs in her presentation. This is a program that we produce with support from the US Department of State. Um, so that's it for my introduction. And we are going to, uh, as I said, we'll shorten this discussion a little bit. We have 35 minutes to hear from our panelists. And 
Um, I'm going to start by asking each of you to share maybe the most innovative and exciting project that you are currently working on in your portfolio that gives you the most hope in terms of what you're doing in your international exchange work. Um, and if you speak for five minutes each, I think that will give you enough time to not only share some specifics about this project and initiative, but to talk about why you designed it and what the outcomes are that you hope to see. Seva, will you start us off? Absolutely. Um, I had a whole thing written, but I'm going to um, nix that and just talk <laughs> extemporaneously to tell you that the Building Bridges program, um, which is housed under the Dars Duke Charitable Foundation, is focused on um, supporting projects of organizations here in the U.S. We're a national funder um, that build connections and understandings between American Muslims and the broader non-Muslim community. Um, so we may be the outlier here in terms of actual work, but what our uh, grantees do is actually um, engage artists that are based internationally. Um, so, so that's us. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about one particular uh, grantee uh, in Minneapolis called the Cedar Cultural Center. And the Cedar Cultural Center is a mid-sized concept presenting organization that lives in the middle of Little Mogadishu, the Cedar Riverside community, which is where the largest Somali diaspora refugee um, community lives. Um, and um, the Cedar decided that it was going to focus on um, Somali music as, and center their project of connecting with um, connecting the two communities, Somali and non-Somali, in this area, in this neighborhood. So they partnered with Augsburg College, which is a small private institution. Um, and they began on the planning phase, but they realized very quickly that um, they could find vocalists in the diaspora, Somali vocalists, but they couldn't find practicing musicians. And the reason for that is that with decades of civil war and the banning of um, music in Somalia, uh, many of the musicians had either abandoned their practice um, or had been uh, harassed or worse um, and had just stopped. So <laughs> the CEDA found that they had this um, grant and they couldn't proceed. So their academic partner, Augsburg College, um, uh, you know, their um, music professor, the head of the music department, decided that he was going to learn Somali music. And then because it's an oral tradition, that he was going to notate it and then teach it to a handful of students at Augsburg College um, and join with some musicians who would stop their practice um, in the Cedar Riverside community and create a house band the backing band, and then, and then they would invite the vocalists um, from the diaspora. And that's how it started. And it became an incredible project because um, a lot of the, um, the concerts were live streamed into refugee camps um, that uh, around the world where the um, Somali um, diaspora was um, clustered. And um, it was really, um, I, I was very touched by one of the presentations. Um, one of the fellows, uh, Artslink fellows, talked about fragmentation um, and um, trauma and um, collective memory. And what these concerts did was really um, invite the diaspora to um, remind them of who they are and um, to empower them. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Shall I jump next? Great. Um, maybe I should provide a little bit of context about Lambent Foundation, and then I'll speak about what is exciting me now. Um, so Lambent funds in three specific areas, New York, New Orleans, and Nairobi. Um, New Orleans, uh, New York because it's our home. 
I work with one individual donor, so there's a lot more freedom and liberation and experimentation than with other um, funding institutions. Um, so New York is our home, New Orleans. Uh, we wanted to do a national work, but I didn't want to build or play, keep money with inside the foundation. I always think you have to move money as fast as you can before we get caught. <laughs> so we keep it really small. Um, but we chose New Orleans uh, for two reasons. Art and culture is infused in the daily fabric, so there wasn't any justification that we needed to do with others. And because there are very few philanthropic dollars that go below the Mason-Dixon line uh, that acknowledges the South. And so it was a political statement for us with that. Um, we were excited about the conversation, but we realized that we couldn't really have a national dialogue without a global context. So that's why we selected Nairobi. And one of the reasons for Nairobi is that the states has a better understanding of a, a West African aesthetic signature and not a lot from East Africa. And East Africa is so vibrant in terms of an Indian, Arabic, and African connotation mixture. So that's how we get to have fun. Um, I'm excited, I, I'm totally moved every day by our partners, but I'm excited by the disruption of our own practice. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to actually talk about philanthropic practice instead of some of our grantee partners, if you guys don't mind. And um, we're disrupting things a little bit. Um, we are questioning th uh, that we don't think money is the most important thing, that we're leaving so much on the table if we're only focusing on the grant making. So spending much more time thinking about what influence might we have with our sector, um, what other relationships that we can illuminate and foster. Um, and so I think that's why I was invited on this panel. Um, we really think about network theory as our practice. So one of the things that we've done is um, increased the amount of money that we give to um, core grantee partners over more significant um, years and that we make this general operating support and that we've done away with proposals and reports and that we're recognizing that this is actually a mutual agreement and so we're spending a lot more time thinking in, in conversation with the leadership of the organization that includes board members so that we collectively hold the intention of the four years of how we're working together um, yeah, so we're, and this is all being made up as we go, um, and so we're practicing this out. Um, what uh, excites me the most is a relationship with a um, philanthropic partner from the Netherlands. So we have been intentional about a relationship with Dune Foundation, and Dune Foundation um, has been a significant funder beyond, behind a network called the Arts Collaboratory which is about 32 uh, arts-centered organizations from the global south. And the relationship between Lambent and Dune has allowed Lambent to peer in, almost like a fly on the wall, to see how a network across multiple continents and different sizes and different languages um, really build a collective community with hopes that Lambent's community, if we can organize it and uh, if we can organize it, can stand alongside in solidarity and have some intersecting touch points along the way. Um, and what I'm appreciative of the partnership with Dune Foundation and Lambent are just the values that we're leading our work with. And so this idea of mutual accountability um, between the funder and grantee partner and the different foundations, the two different foundations that are coming together. The ideal of solidarity, what does solidarity look like with a philanthropic practice? Um, that local relevance is really critical and important, so the New York or US lens is not the only lens that we are leading through, so how does one learn um, and listen better? Mo actually, I would say listen. And this ideal of openness and transparency, which is an, a challenging thing within philanthropy, especially when dealing with wealth, um, but we're willing to try it. So I wanted to offer that 
um, as what is exciting me without it looking egocentric. Hi, so it's really exciting for me to be on this panel, one, because um, I've been on the receiving end, and when I worked at the kitchen, we got a grant from the Lambent Foundation, so um, it's just, you know, really thrilling as someone who's potentially, um, you know, thinking about how to continue to complicate your relationship with philanthropy, but also I'm only three years in, so um, the Arts Exchange is a relatively new initiative at the Open Society Foundation, which historically has had quite a schizophrenic relationship with arts in general. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of based on the fact that many people, um, you know, that the foundation was founded by George Soros and founded, you know, really thinking about um, how to avoid the world turning back the way it has now, right? And, and sort of the linkage between propaganda and fascism. So I think there's been a sort of anxiety around, you know, how do we support artists without um, sort of really telling people what to think? And so, you know, we've had to um, complicate it, which is really simple for people who are Im immersed in the arts to sort of dispel that, but it, it's been um, a little bit of a hurdle. So hopefully we're beyond that moment um, now, but really um, we exist to actually support and encourage our colleagues who are doing arts philanthropy, who are doing social justice and, and um, uh, human rights philanthropy throughout uh, many global contexts to include artists and arts organizations in their strategies. Um, so that is very much an internal project. Um, but one of the things that has been exciting about that is we actually do have the opportunity to do um, some direct grant making and that has uh, materialized as the Soros Arts Fellowship, um, which this is the very first um, cohort of the Soros Arts Fellowship. They are about 10 months into an 18 month fellowship. Um, and it really was developed through a posture of deep listening to artists around many global contexts about what kind of support would actually allow them to think deeply about their local context. Um, and it was really developed around this idea of art, public space, and closing societies. And sort of, you know, what are um, the various conditions that artists are working under and how can philanthropy actually be supportive of that? Um, and also uh, not be um, putting them in, in further danger. So we have a group of eight artists. Um, I'll just sort of mention the context that they're working. Um, Faustin Lynn Likula, who um, you know, has a history with many of us in New York, including Simon Dove, um, is, is from the DRC. And we know him because he is sort of a, a, a a choreographic hero and superstar, especially um, in New York and many European contexts. Um, but you know, thinking about what does it actually mean for him to have the time, space, resources to actually focus on a local project, um, and you know, many artists, as we know, that are working in, in closing contexts or closed contexts, uh, become the institution, right? And so, in the case of Fasten, he's developed. Um, you know, residency space, um, and the project that he's doing for the fellowship is really a film. It's a citizen film about a man who was sort of encouraged by two women in Kailisha in his town to run for a public office. Um, and the reason they did that was really because they wanted to get one person out of poverty. Uh, not that they had a lot of confidence in what it would mean for this person to be, um, you know, an elected official. Um, so it really sort of talks about the sort of uh, crossroads of hope and despair in many ways and sort of, um, you know, the other thing that's really amazing about his kind of practice is that he's also teaching people along the way, um, like I said, building an institution and so how to, you know, how do you create a contemporary dance company? You teach people contemporary dance. How do you make a film um, in that kind of context, teaching people filmmaking while he's learning it himself? Um, so that's just one example. Um, and we have um, two, four other fellows in Africa, Nana Ofriada Ayim in Ghana, um, and Hassan Darcy and Laila Hida in Morocco. Um, we have Guy Regis Jr. in Haiti. Um, Lori Joe Reynolds in Chicago. Um, I'm leaving people out. 
Um, but anyway, it's a quite diverse group of eight artists. Um, Khalid Albea, who is a Sudanese political cartoonist living in exile in Copenhagen, um, but really sort of thinking about how do we create a network for those artists and also support them. So they get an $80,000 fellowship over 18 months to make an ambitiously scaled um, public art project or a project that engages the public. And we thought about this idea of public space really from the lens of um, artists that we talked to in a gathering that we organized called the OSF Arts Forum, which was in Morocco in 2017. It was around this concept of art, public space, and closing societies. And a lot of what we heard was really that safety and security was one of the most important um, things that artists were concerned with. Um, and so within that, we wanted to sort of explore, well, what does it mean to work in exile? What does it mean to have an underground practice um, like the Belarus Free Theater, for example, uh, and what does it mean to, um, you know, really need peers when you're working in that kind of deep isolation. And so this fellowship is really uh, developed to sort of um, construct that kind of circle around a small group of artists over 18 months. And then as it grows this year, the um, fellows will be focusing on art, migration, and public space. Um, that that community will continue to grow. So that's the most exciting thing that I'm working on. Thank you. Um, something that I am hearing a lot from all of you is listening and, and deep listening. And I, that resonates with me because uh, the thing that excites me the most about uh, what I get to do at the Trust for Mutual Understanding is listen to grantees. Um, so, so to give you just a little bit of context of, of who we are, um, we're uh, a, a small, small but mighty foundation. Uh, we were started in 1985 by an anonymous member of the Rockefeller family, and we fund arts and environmental exchanges uh, in 30 countries that encompass Central, Eastern, Southeastern Europe, Central Asia, the Baltic States, the Caucasus, Mongolia, Russia, and the United States. So we have a, a wide, <laughs> wide geographic purview and something that is collectively happening uh, across the board. So I'll talk about the region. I'll say the region, and what I'm talking about are, are those parts of the world that I just mentioned. Um, that's our geographic region. There's a collective anxiety that's happening right now, and it, and it means that we have to do a lot of really deep listening. Um, and, and we have to, uh, in many ways, be a thought partner, not a micromanager, but maybe a, a reflector back. Um, so one way that we've been deeply listening and trying to be responsive to that listening is that, um, particularly for our grantees in the region, the part of the world that I'm talking about, um, you know, we only have four staff people. Um, we only had three staff people. And uh, we cover such a huge geographic territory that we felt like, you know, we, the three of us were on airplanes all the time, which is, which is wonderful and important. Um, but we really felt like we needed a presence closer to the part of the world where we work. So we hired a regional representative, and she's now based in Berlin. Um, and we have a small office for her in Berlin that we rent at the Aspen Institute, Germany. And they've become a very great partner of ours. And um, that's been important for us because we have access also to their facilities. So we are able to uh, convene in a way that uh, we are being constantly asked to do because we have the privilege of sitting in a place where uh, we can see trends that are happening here in the, in the United States that are reflective of trends that are happening in the part of the world where you work. And the grantees keep asking us, please, we want to talk to each other. You guys are nice as staff people, but we really want to be in the room with each other. We really want to talk to each other. We're all in similar situations now, and, and we need uh, time and space to, to, to strategize and to just be in solidarity. Um, so that is something that uh, is exciting. And also, just to touch on a little bit, Michelle, what you were saying is financial support is obviously really, really, really important. But we're also trying to look at what are forms of non-financial support and advocacy that we can provide? So one of those is new for us. It's called Grantee Voices. It's a newsletter, essentially. But it's um, uh, we're sort of obsessed with Bomb magazine and the interview structure of Bomb. So uh, we ask grantees to interview each other, and then we transcribe and, and edit those interviews. Um, and uh, Ariola just participated in one of those. That's coming out soon, I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. 
Uh, so um, th th that's really about uh, raising awareness and um, trying to, to introduce people and ideas and practices to, to a wider audience. And then we're also uh, curating, I guess is the right word. I don't know. We're having more public events at our office. Um, and that is, you know, because we grant making the arts and the environmental sphere, there's so much intersection between those. Um, and we are trying to uh, draw artists and environmentalists together to, to learn across disciplines and also just to, to, to raise awareness um, for people that are coming from um, really difficult, challenging situations and need a lifeline and networking is so important. So we're trying to provide that sort of informal networking too. Thank you all, so appreciate those answers. Um, I'm gonna ask one question, then if we have a few minutes, we'll open it up to everyone. I was gonna ask you all where you sort of thought some of the biggest opportunities lay that maybe, you know, are sort of, um, that any number of, of folks in this ecosystem system could step into, and also what you thought the biggest challenges were to working internationally right now. Some opportunities surfaced just among you already, convening grantees, thinking about ways to uh, provide critical non-financial support, um, and also solidarity networks, uh, listening to grantees. But throw some other opportunities out there, and also if each of you could share, like, this is the big risk slash challenge that keeps me, keeps me up at night. Um, Seba, can we start with you again? Um, the biggest risk, I'll start with that, is um, what has already been touched upon, which is physical risk. Um, I, it does keep me up at night. I worry about uh, grantees doing this very brave work. I worry about um, my colleagues at the foundation and the risk that I am opening them up to. I worry about um, scaling the projects, uh, this wonderful work that our grantees do, um, and putting at risk the, the communities that, they, that participate in the project. So um, I'm worried a lot. But <laughs> at the same time, in this um, very risky but rather fluid uh, era that we're in, there's also great opportunity. And one of the things that we do, that we made a decision to do in the program is to provide strategic communication support by engaging uh, a, communi a communications company that actually um, is the consultant to each grantee for the life of the grant period. So um, it teaches strategic messaging. Um, and it's not just about writing press, uh, press releases. That, that uh, they can do very well, but actually strategic messaging and ways in which to amplify, amplify their stories and to use the tools um, of uh, larger networks to reach across the arts audience, the, the, uh, the choir as it were. And another thing that we're doing is that inspired by our grantees and the communication support, the program itself, uh, our staff of 1.7 uh, people, <laughs> What's, I know. A, what's no, no. a point seven person? <laughs> it's um, um, our program associate who's, um, who is split, yes, um, with another department she shared um, that we um, have actually taken on um, the production with a production company of two videos, two films, two short films that are shareable. And one of them which is called The Secret History of Muslims in America, um, is an animation, and it's going to premiere on a rather large platform in early December. So um, this is not a boast, but it's actually to say that um, we're finding subversive ways, we're sort of ideas are like water. They just flow over constraints, which is the beauty of exchanges, right? And that indomitable human spirit that will be subversive and just um, go around or over or under constraints. Um, that we see ourselves as advocates for the work, for our grantees. Yes, we bring the funding piece, but we also bring our ideas and we, we use, we hope to use these videos as a way to really amplify our grantees' um, voices and their work 
and rich communities, especially in that purple zone. Um, I'm not doing this, but I'm excited by this moment of intersectionality. Yes. Um, uh, you know, we were fighting for eight to ten years, kind of building where we could have the intersection of art and culture and justice issues, and finally criminal justice reform, environment, thanks to TMU, reproductive rights. Everyone is now recognizing the power and the necessity of artists and cultural makers at the forefront alongside of organizers. So that's my optimistic excitement. Um, I'm fearful of the art market and its consumption. I have no idea how to address that. And I'm scared by um, the US lens yeah. and our limitations around race and gender normative uh, realities and that dominating um, how w we continue to engage in the world and it's destructive. Um, afraid of, I feel like it's a little bit of what you all have both said. One, um, just continuing to be in this market driven extractive uh, way of interacting with artists. Um, and just on a personal level, two very good friends of mine that are artists passed away in the past week, under 50 years old. Oh, wow. And I really attribute it to just, yeah, just like a Basquiat situation, you know, where like, how much more can we take from one person? Um, and in order to engage and be successful, which they both were prolific, um, but it, what, is that, what is the toll that that actually takes on humanity at large, really, you know? individuals but also humanity so really th really thinking about how do we develop the different kind of relationship with cultural production um, that is also about surrounding people with support surrounding people with resources and not just monetary resources but also thinking about them as uh, full people so I feel like that's sort of core to why I even do this work uh, but it's it's um, you know really um, it makes me feel ashamed to actually be a part of the art world sometimes, you know? Um, and so I'm really thankful, similar to what you're saying, that we are coming around to a different political reality. And sometimes I say, like, maybe the silver lining of the global rise of fascism is that we realize that all of us have to participate in um, freedom fighting. All of us have to participate in um, sort of coming together on, on the sort of reality of where we could go, uh, which is why I think this kind of exchange is so important. And we were um, able to bring the Belarus Free Theater to do a production in our office, which is appropriate because they're always working in garages and in you know these contexts where um, you know audiences can sort of sneak in to see this work. But it really was about how do we um, have a moment of dystopic visioning to see where we are going, right? So that we can be conscious enough to um, either pump the brakes or get ahead of that and um, really fight on behalf of, of freedom of expression and also on behalf of artists um, who are doing this kind of brave work and who are putting themselves on the very front lines of um, this kind of work. So I feel like I'm in this moment of, of both um, terror and inspiration. I think there's opportunity and disruption. Um, I think that this global climate that we're living in right now, um, we're all, everything is so interconnected and there's actually uh, t time and space to be disrupted. We're all disrupted um, at, at the current moment and it, and it forces us to reach out for each other. Um, it, it forces us to work collaboratively, I think more, um, listen m more deeply um, and to, um, you know, I, I think as foundation staff people, we are disrupted from our usual way of thinking about things and, and our boxes that we get in and our assumptions that we make. Um, we have to think more flexibly. We have to think more uh, more uh, fluidly. Um, and uh, I think for, for uh, particularly for our grantees, we're seeing intersectionality in the sense of we're seeing people reach out for each other and talk to each other across disciplines, across geographic borders, across cultural borders. There's a, again, the word solidarity keeps coming up, but there's a solidarity there 
that is um, uniting people in a way that I, uh, I have, I've been at the Trust for Mutual Understanding 10 years and I haven't seen it like this before. On the other hand, I haven't seen it like this before. And um, the thing that keeps me up at night are faces, people's faces, um, people's stories, people that I care about, people that I've known for a very long time. This part of the world where, where we work at the Trust for Mutual Understanding is very dear to me. I'm half Hungarian, my family lives in Hungary. The situation there is very, very difficult. So it's not just my family, it's our grantees. It's, it's the staff, it's my, my colleagues. Like you said, Zeb, I, I worry about them when they travel. Um, I make them um, constantly check in with me when they're traveling. I'm constantly checking in with them. Um, so th this is a really uh, difficult time. And I think when you care and are open-hearted, uh, it's gonna keep you up at night right now. Simon, it's 4.50, which is when we were supposed to end. Shall we? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take some questions and because our time is so short and we'd love to get a few questions in, I'm just gonna ask you to try really hard to ask your question in 15 seconds, thank you. Yeah, raise your hand if you have a question and we will take it. Shy, shy audience. We've answered all, yes. Thank you. Um, maybe it's not a, a question you can actually answer right now, but how are you incorporating this reality that we have 12 years left <laughs> in your work? Yeah, can I, can I, can I jump yeah. for a sec? So um, the reality of the 12 years left is, is very prominent in our work because we're actually, we're, we're making, we're, we're involved in environmental grant making. So we actually, uh, the field scientists that are out in the Arctic and watching the ice melt are coming in and giving us reports and showing us photos and uh, showing us videos of what they're seeing. Um, so we are trying to balance our grant making in the sense of, um, for a long time we've been thinking about it, there's the arts and there's the environment. And we're trying not to think about it that way so much anymore. And for a long time it was, well, 70% of our grant making is in the arts and 30% is in the environment. And now it's, um, okay, well, 60-40, and we're working toward 50-50, but really what we're just trying to work toward is, um, it's not, I'm not, impact is not the word because we're a foundation that doesn't believe in measuring impact, um, which I know is a pretty rare thing, but um, uh, urgency. Urgency and, work and working together and working across sectors to tell the story because there's so much scientific data that we have, but those stories aren't being told in a way that's motivating people, particularly lawmakers, so th that's. I would love to answer that. Um, um, we're working with a question, and a uh, question was posed to us by our network theory coach, and he asked, um, what ancestor are we in training to be? And it, it really rocked us, and so it's forcing us to think about our own selves, how we love, how we live, and our work, generations ahead, and to find those characteristics and hone on those right now. And so, yeah, I think it's important for all of us to think about um, what are we in training for? What are the ancestral qualities that we are wanting to leave with our children and grandchildren? I don't think we can end any better than that. So yeah. oh, no, there's I'm gonna give you back your, your, your there's time. There's <laughs> um, or do we have one more question? Okay. Yeah, 15 seconds or less. Hi, I'm Claude Grinitsky. I'm the president of, of the Watermill Foundation and uh, the Watermill Center. We've had issues, obviously, of artists who've had visas denied. And so do you find that these very important foundations that you represent, you're able to lobby the State Department or the embassies, or does it not affect anything ever? Because I saw Nina Murray was here earlier. Uh, yes, uh, can, can you do some, I mean, is it possible for you to have some sort of sway? <laughs> Anybody want to take that? Uh, I, I would like to, to answer. Um, 
I'd like to give you an example of what one of our grantees did. Uh, it's Georgetown University, and they had a project with Syrian women refugees, and they were opening that season with this um, theater piece, and they didn't get their visa. So what they did is that they decided to Skype in um, the, the actors, the, the, um, the Syrian refugee ladies from uh, Jordan, from their refugee camp, um, and have the audience um, in the theater. And so um, they talked about the project and the difficulties and the challenges. And then one of the um, ladies asked why their visa was denied. And in the audience, I don't know if you were there that day, Nina, but in the audience was a State Department person, a representative. Um, and uh, the facilitator of the conversation turned to the, to the State Department rep and said, please go ahead and answer the question. And uh, live, they, this person said it was just a bad day. So uh, <laughs> that can mean many things. But um, that was one kind of uh, moment in which um, uh, this art center um, you know, actually turned a really uh, you know, impossible situation over, basically um, not having uh, the work open to a conversation which got uh, actually a lot more engagement, not just with the audience, but in terms of media and attention uh, much more broadly in different um, communities beyond just the art space. Taking my cue from you, Simon, because okay. Nina, do you want to answer? Yeah. <laughs> In the scrum. Into the scrum, which is also live, there's no tougher job than answering consular questions on live stream. I applaud Zanab and your group that found this solution. It is difficult to operate within the constraints that the immigration law puts on us overseas you are unlikely ever to get the answer about why something happened because there is legal protection for the adjudicator the protection is there for their safety and also for the safety of the public all that said work with us early get in touch with us there's a you <laughs> There's my retired colleague there in the audience as well. Especially if you're working with people, with nations that, with states that are sort of in the public view and in the political public view, get in touch with us early, get in touch with the embassy, and have a plan B. And also, I know there is an ongoing effort uh, was in was NEA, so it is also important to advocate domestically. This is another thing that we cannot do. We are an executive agency in terms of managing immigration, <coughs> and in that regard, we do not advocate for changes in policy. We implement the policy. We rely on you to tell our lawmakers what is necessary. So please do that. Thank you. Shall we? Thank you so much. This was a fantastic discussion. And thanks to all of you. You are so inspiring, those we've heard from on stage, and just our friends and colleagues in the audience. Thank you. Thank you.